Hello, everyone. My name is Daniel Fulpo with Mita M. Stein Trevor, Curator at the Washington County Museum of Fine Arts, and it's my pleasure to welcome you back to the Curator's Den. This is a program in which I explore different stories behind works of art in our collection at the museum in Hagerstown. And today I'm going to be speaking with you about uh, a series of Egyptian um, art objects in the collection. And we kind of take a different turn from previous programs that I've done uh, in terms of the fact that we're looking at archeological artifacts and particularly sculptures, uh, as well as one uh, decorative piece. So um, it's gonna be very interesting to sort of delve into this because these works had previously not been um, as fully researched as we uh, might've hoped. But now, thanks to the efforts of my colleague, Audrey Scanlon Teller, who was our uh, National Endowment for the Humanities curatorial assistant and her colleague, Dr. Regina Schultz, director of the Rumer Peltzeus Museum in Hildesheim, Germany, we're able to share our new findings with you. So without further ado, I am going to share my screen with you and we'll begin to launch into this program about our new discoveries at the museum. Just before we begin, I just wanna thank Volvo for its sponsorship of the program today. And we have here an introductory slide which shows you the three pieces that I'm gonna be focusing on. They include this statue, this small one up here, it's about this big a Shopti figurine here, and then a beautiful pectoral necklace with a scarab beetle as the centerpiece. That will be the topic of today. Just uh, prior to jumping into the objects themselves, as well as some of the history about them, I would like to just uh, orient you to the historical and cultural context at which we're looking, and specifically that's ancient Egypt. Many of you may be familiar with the basic history of ancient Egypt. It is one of the most important ancient cultures and civilizations of the Mediterranean world. Its influence extended beyond Africa all the way into other parts of the ancient Near East, as well as to Greece. It would have great impacts on the artistic and cultural development of, it, of civilizations neighboring it in the ancient Mediterranean. And this is a map that orients you to some of the most important sites. Of course, we have Alexandria, where the very famous Rosetta Stone was found. And then we have here the um, very important site of Giza, where the pyramids put up uh, first in the Old Kingdom of Egypt, Egypt being divided up into different periods with Old, Middle, and New Kingdoms, and then also the periods interspersed in between there with different names, many different dynasties this whole area being what we call Lower Egypt. And then as you go um, up the Nile, you come into Upper Egypt to other important sites that include Abydos, which I'll be mentioning today, and also the Valley of the Kings, which contains many different sites and temples. And of course, all of this being made possible by the Nile River, which when it flows into the Mediterranean Sea is a very large delta. This allowed for soil to be very fertile during the ancient uh, Egyptian civilization. This is what would give them life, literally, would contribute to their economy. You have great farming and the uh, development of a very sophisticated civilization in this area. Also the geography allowed them, that is the Egyptians, to enjoy in certain periods of their history, a degree of protection as opposed to the ancient Near Eastern cultures, which were subject to more frequent invasion. And here we have some photos that show some highlights. We have here a very elaborate sarcophagus of King Tut. We have a statuary here. Um, we have the Sphinx, also at Giza. And then we have this uh, beautiful stele of Akhenaten and his wife. And you also have several other representative examples here, of course, of the pyramids, a fragment from an important papyrus scroll, and the stele of King Narmer the pre-dynastic period in ancient Egypt. I'll also be mentioning that today. So it's a very rich culture. We'll only be able to scrape the surface of certain periods today. But we'll be looking at how they intertwine with the objects at the Washington County Museum of Fine Arts and their overall significance. Of course, when we think of ancient Egypt, the pyramids certainly come to mind. And these were first put up 
during the Old Kingdom period. And these, of course, as I mentioned, are, are Giza. And the ancient Egyptians, like many other ancient uh, civilizations in the Mediterranean, were polytheistic. That is, they believed in many different gods. However, with the Egyptians, there's this considerable preoccupation and focus on an investment in the peace of the dead, and specifically ensuring against displeasing the spirits of the deceased. It was very important for ancient Egyptians to make sure that the dead had a safe, comfortable, and in many cases, in the case of a royal patron, namely a pharaoh, that their tombs, in this case, the pyramids, would be uh, elaborately decorated, and also that the shrine itself, their sarcophagus placed within that context, would be contain many different objects. And some of the things we see today relate to that concept. And as we also know, the ancient Egyptians were ruled by, for much of their history, uh, pharaohs. The pharaohs were both gods and kings. They were all divine. They were supreme leaders. They were worshipped, just as, it, as many of the Roman emperors were you know, later on in ancient history. So this is something to really keep in mind, that the, that the safekeeping of the dead is critical to the ancient Egyptians. Some of their very important gods included Ra, who was the most important god in many periods of ancient Egypt. He was a sun god. We also have Maat, goddess of truth, justice, and harmony. Osiris, who will be mentioned today, the god of the dead, the ruler of the underworld. And another, for example, Anubis, god of embalming the dead. And the embalming in terms of the burial is very important. When we think, of course, of Egyptian mummies, for example, it is the art of preservation of the body before it's placed within the elaborate sarcophagus. And this is an important part of ancient Egyptian burial practice and religion. And I had mentioned before the spirits of the dead, they must remain at peace because if they did not remain at peace, the ancient Egyptians believed they would come back and haunt or disturb the living. Each person, according to the ancient Egyptians, was composed of three essential elements, the ba, soul or personality, the ka, the life force, and the ak, the body in which the soul is kept. These are very critical ideas uh, underpinning the burial of the dead in ancient Egyptian culture. It was believed that upon death, the ba and the ka became separated from the body, but would remain alive in the afterlife. In ceremonies such as the opening of the mouth, the ba and the ka were thought to be released into the afterlife for the next world. How do we know about the ancient Egyptian cultures? How are we able to decipher those ancient hieroglyphs? Well, this happened when the Rosetta Stone was discovered. And that, was, that occurred in 1799 when Napoleon Bonaparte took a small troop of scholars and linguists, artists as well, on a military expedition to Egypt where he compiled a very famous tome called the Description de l'Egypte. And in that expedition, Napoleon's men uh, found the Rosetta Stone. And it was named after the Rosetta close to the Mediterranean, not far from Alexandria, which I showed you on the map before. This was a critical find um, because this allowed archeologists to be able to decipher the ancient Egyptian hieroglyphs. And we're going to see an example of some of those hieroglyphs today with one of the sculptures in our collection. It, it, the, the Rosetta Stone itself is actually a decree that was uh, created and inscribed on this uh, large stone slab that was put up on behalf of King Ptolemy. This is in the late period of Egyptian history, not uh, long uh, before the Romans are going to conquer Egypt. And it appears in three scripts to decree. The upper text is ancient Egyptian hieroglyphs, as you can see here, the middle portion, demotic script, and the lowest is ancient Greek. Because it presents essentially the same text in all three scripts with some minor differences among them, it provided the key to the modern understanding of the hieroglyphs. Essentially, the archeologists were able to use this as a guide, as a key with a, a uh, large number of significant and repeated hieroglyphs to be able to make out what exactly the, each of them meant. Of course, further research and studies would be uh, conducted later on, but this was essentially what happened at the time. And the Rosetta Stone is a subject unto it itself. Today, it's in the British Museum. With that as the basis, 
historians and archaeologists were able to delve further into Egyptian civilization. Each of those symbols, little pictures representing ideas, words, and they even go beyond that. Now, coming back from Egypt itself, we come closer to home and we look at the origins of our small Egyptian collection at the museum. It begins actually with, as many other things at our institution, with our founders. Anna and William Singer are shown in this lovely photograph up here. Their vision was based upon the collecting of art from many different periods. William himself was a painter. Anna was from Hagerstown uh, and she married William in the late 1890s. And they would uh, move on and have a life together overseas, particularly in Holland. And then they would divide their time uh, at different seasons in Norway, between Norway and Holland. But as you can see in this photograph of their home in Galericum, they believed in collecting art from all over the world. Of course, they had uh, European portraits, both your, um, uh, from uh, their own times, as well as from the 19th century, but they also collected ancient uh, art as well, particularly Chinese and also some Japanese ceramics. And very interestingly, the first Egyptian work that we have in the collection, this one shown here of this figurine, which came to the museum in 1949 when Dr. John Richard Kraft was the uh, director at the time. And at that time, the museum had two new wings, which are shown here with the Bowman Gallery there, and then the Singer Gallery added on to the other end. Those two wings were put up. This Egyptian statuette came as a gift in 1949 from the Singers. And it was under Dr. Kraft that we began to uh, display ancient artworks, such as the one we're looking at. Now, in order to understand the conception and the, uh, the execution of works like this, we need to understand the Egyptian mindset and the aesthetic. We see here, I had mentioned at the beginning, the palette of King Narmer. This is one of the most famous, very early, uh, and also one of the oldest surviving Egyptian artifacts. Often it's part of the canon of the art historical survey. And it essentially shows the early Egyptian king, King Narmer, engaged in uh, battle with his uh, opponents, but the whole entire stele is symbolic of his unification of Upper and Lower Egypt. And it conforms to the palette of King Narmer, a canon of proportions. And this canon of proportions refers to a set of artistic or aesthetic standards, values, or guidelines that govern the creation of Egyptian art, and particularly sculpture and relief decoration, as well as painting. It was each of the figures, this looking at a relief would be laid out on a grid type pattern, and artists were expected to conform to these rules. As you could see, they used almost like a Cartesian coordinate plane to plan these. And it's very much set up in this way. When we're looking specifically at sculpture and relief, we have hieratic or hierarchical scale. This type of idea is certainly applied to Egyptian sculpture. It also shows up in the illustrations. For example, this one, the judgment of Hunifer before Osiris, god of the underworld from the 19th dynasty. And each of these figures is placed again within that grid, within that system. And artists were expected to follow and conform to those standards. You can also see how it works with large sculptures carved out of slabs of stone, in this case, diorite, the King Khafre, uh, which was found at Giza in Egypt. He commissioned one of the pyramids there. And this also conforms to those ideas and principles. Similarly, for smaller scale objects like this one that's in our collection from the Singers, it, it also conforms to these ideas. And you're going to see how, when we compare this to other works, how it, uh, how it fits in. And so this is what started our interest in collecting arts of the ancient Mediterranean, specifically Egypt. This uh, work for a long time was in storage. And during this uh, pandemic, I've had the opportunity to sort of dig in and look more closely at the collections. And this uh, statue, at first, we had no idea which period in which to place it. But thanks to um, Audrey Scanlon-Teller and Dr. Regina Schultz, in particular, 
we were able to identify this and narrow it down to specifically, uh, Dr. Schultz did the late Middle Kingdom or 13th Dynasty. And it's a portrait of a, it's a representation of a cloaked seated man or an official. It's made out of calcite alabaster, as you can see, these little sort of roofs of brownish red that run through it. And it's about, as I mentioned at the beginning, it's about this large, so it's not very big. But it is actually quite a, a powerful and arresting uh, work. As you can see, the artist tried to depict the details of the sitter, though very abstractly. And that's another important thing to know about Egyptian art. The canon of proportions also called for a certain degree of abstraction. Now, that does not mean that artists did not use naturalism in ancient Egyptian sculpture. There was some. It depended on the patron, it depended on the pharaoh, the official. And this type of sculpture, uh, would have been used in a shrine. If we compare ours, you can see that there's a quite a bit of variation in, in these of the late Middle Kingdom. You have ours on the left here. We have one from the Metropolitan Museum of Art in New York. And then you have one on the right uh, from the Royal Scottish Museum in Edinburgh. And as you can see, you have quite a bit of variation between the different sculptures, ours being very abstract in terms of how it's almost fully melding and engaged with the block, the seat type block on which it's seated. The one from the Met, we have more detail. And also over here, this one, possibly made of diorite, shows again that the figure with the arms folded across the chest. But one of the curious things about the Hagerstown example is that you have the hands in the opposite direction. Whereas usually this hand is placed over, the left hand is placed on the right side of the chest like this, ours, it's inverted. And it would appear that the figure holds onto some kind of a crook or a scepter. And this is shown as you're gonna see in some examples. Here, this figure may also be clutching one, but notice how his head is really abstract. Another characteristic feature are the legs fully pulled together as well as the webbed feet. So you have a great bit of a variation upon the theme. If we compare the two, another set, for this one from the Brooklyn Museum, you can see again those similarities between them. Again, holding on to the crook in our example, and then over here you have this one from Brooklyn that shows similar qualities, characteristics. Another thing that keys us into the fact that we're looking at late Middle Kingdom is the wig and the very large ears of the of the figure itself. This likely in both instances, we're looking at some kind of an important political official. And in both of these cases, we don't know exactly who this individual may have been. Clearly though, they had certain status. In some cases though, we do know as this one in the Virginia Museum of Fine Arts in Richmond of a seated official named Horah from about 1730 BCE, also Middle Kingdom it shares those similar characteristics. However, the reason it's able to be identified as Haraz, it has these hieroglyphs. Again, the shared features of the wig, the wide open eyes and the very large ears, as well as the sort of angular chin. These are some of those hallmark characteristics that Egyptologists use in trying to identify the figures. But what's very interesting is this style of the later Middle Kingdom sometimes lasted on a bit later. In some cases, uh, depending even into the second intermediate period in the New Kingdom, this one being the statue of an official named uh, Men Menkep Parasenep, which is shown here, about 1450 BCE, so somewhat later, but it's still carrying some of those same characteristics. This one having hieroglyphs, though, and you can see that the artist the sculptor has changed it a bit. Still, though, the large ears, though, a change in style of headdress in particular. Now you might ask yourself, what kind of context would this sculpture have been designated for? Well, according to uh, Dr. Schultz, we might think uh, that this type of piece was used to adorn something called a stilla. And a stilla is an upright stone slab or column, typically bearing a commemorative inscription or relief design. And it often served as a gravestone or a grave marker. This one that I show you here is the uh, Stella at, uh, of uh, Sahator, who's an official. And it's possible that our statue 
over here on the right may have originated from the same location, this one uh, from Abydos. So this is a possible location of where it may have been produced in Upper Egypt. And as you can see, they contained elaborate reliefs. Sculptures like this likely would have been placed somewhere along the base of this. So basically you have what was a false doorway, it was not actually engaged necessarily within an architectural context as meaning a step through to the other side of the shrine, they were used as a marker. So it may have been placed either within this space here or on the outside as a secondary adornment to it. And this was a common practice at the time. Just because our example does not have hieroglyphs does not mean that it is not ancient. Uh, because again, as I mentioned before, we have a lot of variation within this uh, tradition. So that's one hypothesis of where this may have been intended. And again, this type of sculpture was, in, was designated as a piece to accompany this official or individual. In some cases, it might even be a higher ranking person, such as a pharaoh, not necessarily for ours, to accompany that individual into the afterlife. And that's a very important part of the process. And as we continue on the museum's history, we have to cr also credit Bruce Etchison, who was our director from 1951, uh, 1950, 51 to 1964. Here he is shown in a photograph with one of our 18th century European portraits, formerly attributed to um, Seibold, a German artist, but one that I'm, that I'm currently working on reattributing. He used to often appear on television and that's what he's doing here. He was doing distance instruction and learning, um, inaugurating that first program at our museum in the 50s and into the 60s. It was Bruce who purchased the next set of works that I'm going to show you. And that happened in uh, 1958, he purchased a group of objects for the Museum of Fine Arts that were representative of the cultures of the ancient Mediterranean and specifically ancient Egypt. It's documented and shown here as 24 Mediterranean cultural objects in the annual report from 1958 and then the works went out on exhibit shortly thereafter in May. As part of our recent accessions of a group of objects of Mediterranean culture. And I should point out that we do have some others that I hope to share with you in the future, in addition to the Egyptian pieces. The uh, Shapti, uh, the pectoral necklace we will see today, there were also some Roman eating utensils and uh, Ptolemaic bronze sculptures and amulets which will be the subject of a future program. So these were on view in our ceramics gallery, which is today our Fulton Gallery. From there, we turn to another one that's very fascinating and which does have hieroglyphs on it. This is something called the Shapti figure. And the Shapti is very important in uh, ancient Egypt, particularly after a certain date, particularly 1800 BCE. It, it translates from an ancient Egyptian word meaning answerer. It was a type of funerary statuette that Egyptians uh, believed would again help accompany the deceased into the afterlife. And it, they were supposed to answer the call for work in the next world. So there, the idea was that they would accompany an individual and official and perform certain duties for them as they continued their lives. Oftentimes the figures will hold in their hand a hoe or a crook, sometimes symbolic of performing those manual labor tasks in the next life. And some of them also intended to suggest that they would farm for the deceased, providing them with sustenance and uh, food, as well as prosperity. As you can see here, it's holding on to one uh, right here. Again, according to the new research conducted by Dr. Schultz, this work was created for the tomb of an important Egyptian government official. And the hieroglyphs on the front of the statuette translate to the following, and I quote, Osiris, the enlightened one, Ptah, who is south of his wall, parentheses, Memphis, as in Memphis, Egypt, the justified privy counselor, Ahmos Nefer Sakmet. Based on the inscription, this sculpture was carved in honor of Osiris, god of the underworld and judge of the dead. In addition, it was dedicated to Ptah, deity of craftspeople and architects. So it's possible that the official who commissioned this uh, shakti, this answer figurine, 
had some kind of a role in overseeing those activities. And that this Shakti was intended to accompany him into the afterlife in order to direct uh, trades activities, artisanal activities, so to speak, of artisans. In ancient Egypt, privy counselors, in this case, they were referred to as Saab, advised the pharaoh on state affairs and political policy. So it's possible that this uh, individual commissioned this Shakti Ahmos Nefer Sakhmet might have served in either the reign of Pharaoh's Teos I from about 360 to 359, or possibly Nectanebel, whose reign lasted from 360 to 342 BCE. But note some of those aspects of the earlier Middle Kingdom sculpture that we see here. The hairdo, possibly not a wig, but the large ears as well. They carry on down through this period. Here are some photographs that show you what the work looks like all around. As you can see, it's not very large. It's about this big, and it rests on top of this base. We're looking at approximately 30th Dynasty, 380 to 343. So it has a very interesting story to tell. As a comparison, here we have one here that is listed on, a, um, on the internet. You can see the variation between these. Some of them in the officials also have wear, carry very elaborate uh, beards. And you can see though how they are almost always placed upon these bases. Or for example, these ones that date from perhaps slightly uh, later in the Peabody Museum on the left at Yale University. And then on the right, several that appeared on the uh, uh, art market at uh, Christie's. Again, always with these, almost always with these Egyptian hieroglyphs that spell out that all important description. So we can actually connect the example in the Washington County Museum of Fine Arts to a specific dynasty. However, in other specific dynasty and ruler, however, in some cases, we're not able to do that because we have such a large range of dates. That would apply to the situation here with this beautiful Egyptian pectoral necklace with a winged scarab dating from 760 to 332 BCE. This is one of my favorite pieces in the collection of these Egyptian antiquities because it's just full of this vibrant blue color. Uh, actually, if you had a chance to see it, this work was featured in our seldom seen exhibition, as was the Shakti figurine that I showed you before that was up last year all the way through the fall, the summer to the fall. And it's actually quite large. When it's strung out, it extends larger than I'm showing you here on the screen. And it's just beautiful. Uh, it's, it's just gracefully uh, executed and it has this lovely combination of elements that I'm going to share with you. Egyptian necklaces like this one were employed by people for polytheistic and religious and ritualistic purposes. Since the Egyptians emphasized the significance of providing the best possible conditions again for a deceased individual's journey to the afterlife, pectoral necklaces were equally important for the placement in a wide range of tombs, temples, and shrines. Part of Egyptian funerary practice, winged scarabs, like the one I'm showing you here, were closely associated with the sun god Ra. They served as popular symbols of protection and rebirth. And you'll note here the lotus petals as well. These are equally significant. They symbolized the sun, again, connected with Ra, creation, and the deceased individual's entry into the underworld and their subsequent reincarnation. It's about rebirth, it's about regeneration. It's not the end of life for ancient Egyptians in this context. It's the beginning of another one. And that's a really critical thing to keep in mind. It presents quite a contrast as well, to some degree with other cultures in the ancient Mediterranean. The, for example, the ancient Greeks, not that they weren't uh, uh, interested in the afterlife, they weren't quite as preoccupied in their religion as the Egyptians. And it's one of those things that distinguishes their culture. Our example, you can find parallels with other sculpted pieces, such as this one in the Museum of Fine Arts, Boston. And over here, we've got one in the Smithsonian that I'll show you a detail of afterwards. So these were actually quite common at the time. I should mention that the works that we're looking at were produced oftentimes on a large scale. The Shakti figures actually were mass-produced because you had so many tomb and shrine 
dedications and commissions that artisans had to have a steady supply of these to fill those sacred spaces. Here's a close up on the central amulet, the uh, centerpiece. Jewelry of this kind were often worn as talismans. They were believed to protect the living and the deceased from evil or harm. And the beetle and the lotus petals were made using a combination of clay and ground copper or tin, while the turquoise coloring was achieved by applying a glaze to the surface of those parts and then firing them in a kiln. And that's similar to what we saw before with the Ushaptis. These are also faience. So the Egyptians were very skilled at uh, firing clay and other um, materials. The other important thing to realize is the mummy nets. These are actually restrung beads made out of mummy nets. And a mummy net, so this was actually probably taken from another object as it was restrung with the repurposed uh, beads as well, the earth tone beads, the, the nets typically were these complicated beaded constructions. And they employed the fragments, the fibers, as shrouds to cover and decorate an embalmed corpse. So this amulet may have been placed upon the corpse itself inside of a sarcophagus. And this is significant because the reuse of the sacred textile, that is the mummy net materials, as well as the beads, underscore the sacred nature of the work. And they emphasize the connection of the individual who would be adorned with this for their safe passage uh, and their departure for the afterlife. So we'll take a look at a couple of details here. Here are a couple more. This, these ones again from the Museum of Fine Arts in Boston. And you can see the similarities with ours as well. They date from the same period. We call this the late period, eighth century to fourth century BCE. The same kind of striations to mark the wings of the insect. And here's a larger image of the one that's at the National Museum of Natural History at Smithsonian with that mummy net that's been restrung and combined with the beads. Here's a close up of the one that we have in our collection and another one over here that shows how they were, there was this variation of the beads and these fired fans elements pulled together to create an overall decorative scheme. So I thank you for joining me today in our first foray into the look at the ancient Egyptian artworks in our collection, and also to explore some archaeology and ancient Egyptian history. Next time, we'll have another segment as I take you through a virtual discussion of these three, uh, excuse me, these four amulets, also Egyptian and from different periods as we look at the importance of specifically ancient Egyptian deities. Thanks so much for joining me, and I look forward to seeing you on our next edition of The Curator's Day. Take care for now and bye.